From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Bigby here. Dr. Bigby. I'm asking you for the second time now to come out to the Cronin place. I told you last night, Mr. Dollar. The circumstances are different now, a lot different. We don't need a doctor. We need a coroner. A coroner? Where are you calling from? The operator told me the phone out there was out of order. It is. I'm at a forestry station a mile down the road. Jason Prell cut the wires last night before he was killed. Jason killed? Shot to death during the storm. So that's how he ended up. It took a long time, but everything finally comes home. Yes, Mrs. Cronin said the same thing an hour or so before she died. Dolly, too. Her heart, Mr. Dollar? In a way, maybe. The dancing darling. Finally at rest. She... What do you mean, in a way? Dr. Bigby, Mrs. Cronin was murdered. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at the Cronin Estate, Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. Expense account, final page. Item 13, 10 cents. A half pack of cigarettes I left with a farmer who gave me a lift back from the forestry station. The price of my own feelings at the moment would have been lower. About eight cents lower, in fact. I brewed another pot of coffee and sat down to wait for Bigby. But this time I laced the coffee with brandy. The sun was up by then, clear of the horizon, bringing a bright new morning and a brand new day. The storm was long over, and the world sparkled and danced. But too much of the night was still with me, and the past still too much alive. And yet, maybe Dolly Cronin was better off. She was a part of that past now, where friends were always true. Every minute of life was even more wonderful than the last one. And where she was still and forever, the dancing darling. Good morning, Johnny. Oh, hi, Sylvia. I'm in the coffee business this morning. How about it? Please. Mm. Having yours with cream, I see. Yeah, bad night. Shall I make yours the same way? Right. I had a bad night, too. Thanks. Hmm. You look real beat, Johnny. Couldn't be any beater. Something pretty terrible happened last night, didn't it? Yes. Jason Prell is dead. Oh. And Dolly Cronin is dead. Oh, no. I loved her, Johnny. I didn't mean what I said last night about life always having been too easy for her, and you were right. It was just being frustrated, tied in knots and covering up. I loved her. She was sweet. Yeah, she was quite a girl. She had something, I don't know. She had love. She loved people, and they loved her in return. Maybe so. Anyway, I guess this belongs to you now. The necklace? The circle of fire? What do you mean it belongs to me? She made a will last night. I witnessed it. She left the necklace to you. I just can't believe it. Johnny, can I... Can I put it on? Why not? It's yours. She wanted you to have it. You look good in it. I just can't believe it, Johnny. Well, before you get carried away too far, maybe you'd better brace yourself. Oh, it's not mine after all. Oh, it's yours, all right. But it's not real. What? It's a good copy, worth maybe four or five hundred dollars, but that's all. Well, I... I, I, I don't understand. It's so well known. The, the circle of fire, it's been written up over and over. Yeah, from old records. But nobody's really examined it for years, since before Barnaby Cronin died. It's been locked up in a bank vault until I took it out. Was there ever a real one? Yes, originally. But it was broken up and disposed of years ago. Jason Prell knew it, was in on the substitution, I suppose. That's why he was so desperate to steal it from me and get rid of it before I found out it was a copy. He knew that if that deal came to light, it would call attention to some of his other activities, worse ones. What do you mean? Prell had complete charge of Mrs. Cronin's estate. He told me it was worth practically nothing. But according to records I saw in New York, it amounted to over a million dollars in the beginning. He was stealing her blind all these years. Oh, it was easy. She was alone in the world, knew nothing about business. She trusted him, thought he was her friend. She trusted everybody, much too much. Well, she sure trusted the wrong ones, including her husband. Barnaby? Sure. 
What do you think disposed of the necklace and slipped her a copy after making such a big deal out of his fabulous wedding gift? A phony. And she worshipped him. The king. In her book, the man who could do no wrong. Well, in the business book, he didn't do much else but wrong. According to the records, most of his deals were pretty shady. Especially after he and Prell teamed up. Yes, Miss Atherton? Dr. Bigby is here to see you. All right, show me. Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't believe too much of what he says. He's a chronic drunk. Yes, I remember you telling me. Show him in. Yes, sir. Well... I was just thinking, Johnny. Mrs. Cronin didn't know any of this, I assume. No, she was safe in her dream world. And she thought she was giving me the real necklace. That's right. It's crazy. And kind of wonderful, isn't it? Just like that, she gave me something she thought was worth a half a million dollars. Just because I was nice to her and liked her. You know something, Johnny? What? I'm just as glad it is a copy. It's beautiful, and, and I love wearing it. I'd have been scared of the real one. And I'll always remember that, like that dream world of hers, she thought it was real. One more question left, but a big one. The question of murder. And I already had the answer. I was sure of it. And I knew there was nothing I could do about it. Dr. Bigby was a man under 60, but he looked years older, a harried man, tired and worn. He sat down for a moment and we talked. And I began to realize that here was another man who'd been under Dolly Cronin's spell. And who was shocked and hurt by her dying. It was a remarkable thing and a difficult one to explain, Mr. Dollar. Like many another, I suppose, I often wondered why I felt the way I did about her. It was a, a sort of magic she had. Yeah, I know. Even as a girl here in the village, she had that same power and had it without knowing it. Everybody loved her. No, not quite everybody. At least one person didn't. Yes, you mentioned on the phone the word murder. That's right, Dr. Bigby. Who killed her? A man we can't touch because he's already dead. Jason Prell. Well, he's done about everything else, I guess. I wouldn't put it past him. What do you base it on, Mr. Dollar? A bottle of pills. Prell supposedly went to Tupper's Lake last night and got a prescription filled for Mrs. Cronin. She took some of it this morning, an hour and a half before she died. There it is. I'd seen the bottle on the train coming up with a few tablets left on the same prescription. And these are different. Well, you're right on one count, Mr. Dollar. Those aren't what the prescription calls for. What do you mean, one count? I talked to the druggist at Tupper's Lake on the phone last night. He told me about Jason being in. All right, it still stands. He had the prescription filled and then changed the tablets, substituted these. It's possible. Would you happen to know what they are without having them analyzed? I've got a pretty good idea, but I'll wait until I've examined her before I'll say positively. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I'd like to explain why I wouldn't come out when you called me last night. Yeah, I wish you would. I'd been drinking. So I gathered. I'd been drinking that other time, too, and I'd made a mistake. I didn't want to make another one. Just what do you mean? When Barnaby Cronin died here, I signed the death certificate. Yes, I know. I hadn't treated him. He was dead when I came out. I called it a heart attack. I was drunk. And I was wrong. Barnaby was poisoned. Go on. I didn't suspect it until later. And then I was afraid to do anything about it. I'd signed that certificate, and I knew it would break me. So I kept still. And I consoled myself with drink. And finally, it broke me. So the same end result was achieved. Look, Dr. Bigby, if Barnaby Cronin was here alone, then how was he poisoned? Alone? He wasn't alone. When he died, she was here with him. Mrs. Cronin? Of course not. Why do you think he was always making trips up here, always by himself? I didn't know he was. For years, every week or two, the whole village knew about it. She was here with him that night. She's the one who called me, asked me to protect her good name. She's the one who poisoned him. And now she's had another try with the same poison. But why? Ask her why. Ring for her and ask her. That won't be necessary. <clears throat> well, I'll go on up and make my examination. Well, Miss Atherton, I'm asking, why? 
He was planning to break off our relation. He told me that night. She'd finally won. That silly little fool had finally won. But I didn't let her win. I killed him. You're confessing to murder, you know. It doesn't matter now. I've accomplished everything I meant to accomplish. So it was you who changed the tablets in her prescription bottle and substituted the poison. Of course. It was so easy. For once in my life, things were just as easy for me as they'd always been for her. Will you have the sheriff come out, Mr. Dollar? I'd like to make my confession. <laughs> It's odd how things work out sometimes, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Mrs. Cronin said something like that last night. I was pretty certain when you showed me the tablets, but I wanted to make my examination first. What do you mean? After Barnaby died and I started to suspect Miss Atherton, I managed to steal the poison from her in order to analyze it. I substituted harmless tablets of the same general appearance. And those are what she's kept all these years? What she gave to Mrs. Cronin? That's right. They were perfectly harmless. In that case... Dolly Cronin died from a heart condition. The tablets had nothing to do with it. In a sense, Dolly died the same way she lived. From natural causes. Expense account item 14, $83.90. Incidentals and transportation from Wells Falls back to Hartford. Expense account total, $263.30. End of account, end of report. Remarks... The insurance angle here seems a little muddy. Premiums were paid for years on an item that didn't exist. And yet, no claim was filed and none will be. So, well, I leave it to your legal eagles. Me, I'm beaten, tired, and maybe a little sad. I've come out of this with a kind of nostalgia. And for a time and place I never even knew. And I'm halfway in love with a girl back in that time and place. A girl I've never seen. Oh, sure, I know. It's a dream world and a dream girl, and none of it exists. But it's too bad. I wish it did. Because she must have been a honey, a real sweetheart, a dancing darling. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, the story of a man worth $50,000 who didn't have a cent to his name. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Shirley Mitchell, Vivi Janis, Barbara Fuller, Benny Rubin, John Daner, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Mm-hmm.